A few years into high school, I joined the basketball team. I was on the basketball team from my sophomore year to my senior year in high school. Loved basketball, everything that went with it. Um, I got my first job. My first job was actually at Wendy's, believe it or not. Really? Yeah, I was at Wendy's. I was at Wendy's. I was actually, I was actually the fry cook, and then I also, also um, worked at the window and took orders as well. So, you know, I had, a, I had a friend who I worked with. His name was Q. He was on the football team. And Q was bringing in these checks every week, like $250, $300 every week. And I'm like, wow, how can I get $300 a week? You know what I'm saying? Because my checks were probably like 180 200 So I found out Q was actually putting in more hours than I was. So that really upset me or whatever. So I went over and found a new job at Zaxby's. I ended up getting fired from Zaxby's three months into that job. So that really upset me. Why'd you get fired? Why'd I get fired? They said I called out too many times. Yeah. So, you know, getting fired really did something to me on the inside. I didn't like that. You know, nobody should, but I put on the facade like I didn't care. You know, I'll find another job, whatever. So while I'm in high school, there are all these kids who are shopping at this place called Nordstrom. They're buying their true religion jeans and their rock and republic jeans. So I've never been in there before, so I go in there and I check it out and I really like the store. So I told myself, you know what, I'm gonna get a job here. So I filled out the application online. The next day they ended up calling me. I came in for the interview and when I came in for the interview, I'm wearing like these wrinkled khaki, it was my first like real interview. So I'm wearing these wrinkled khaki pants because I wasn't a real church goer, so I really never had to dress up. I'm wearing this wrinkled shirt, got an old tie probably from like four years ago, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, I go in there and I'm talking to the men's shoe manager because that's where I wanted to work, men's shoes, because I love shoes, you know. So anyway, I'm in there, I'm interviewing with him. We're doing a pretty good job. I actually, he actually ends up liking me a lot. So he tells me, I'll give you a call um, if you got the job or not. So that weekend, he gave me a call. I ended up getting the job. I had never sold anything in my life before, so they basically had to teach me how to sell. So they're teaching me things like bring out four pairs of shoes instead of one so you can make suggestions towards the customer, all different things like that. So I learned how to sell, and my paychecks graduated from about $200 every week. So now I'm making about $800 to $1,500 every week. In high school? No, no, I graduated by this time, yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm making about, huh? I was working in men's shoes, yeah. So basically you get paid off of commission. So the more you sell, the more you make. That's basically how it works. So I love selling. Ever since I got that job, I'm a diehard salesman, which is why I started selling homes and I also worked for Keller Williams. It's a real estate company, so now I sell homes as well. But while I was working at Nordstrom, one of the main things that influenced me were the people who were working around me. So I'm working in men's shoes and across the way we have men's furnishings where they sell shirts and ties. Then over next to them they have men's suits where they sell um, clothing and men's suits and all that. So the guys who were working in these departments are like 30 or 40 years old. And I started talking to them and these guys started talking to me on a day-to-day -day basis about things like my 401k, things I should be investing in, homes, you know, the type of girls I should be picking, you know what I'm saying, things like that. So I didn't realize how much of an impact that these guys had on me until they asked me to um, step up and become an assistant manager in Lady Shoes. So now I'm 20 years old. I'm working in Lady Shoes as an assistant manager. So basically I was writing the schedule, bringing people in, you know, scheduling all that. And I graduated to about making $1,500 every two weeks, okay? So I'm in lady shoes. I do pretty well at the job. Everybody loves me, you know what I'm saying? We're making good money. Our department is doing very well. So the next week, a few weeks into it actually, they gave me another promotion, which, which I was making $30,000 a year. 
Okay, plus commission. Okay? All right. So, <laughs> still at age 20. Still at age 20. So, anyway, after that, a year into it, they offered me another position across the street as a manager of men's shoes in that department. So I go on over to men's shoes, and I end up making $45,000 a year at 21, okay? So I'm there over in men's shoes, and I'm managing not only, I'm sorry, not men's shoes, I'm over there managing men's shoes, kid shoes, lady shoes, everything. All shoes, All shoes okay? So I'm making about $50,000 a year, plus my bonuses, because every time my department has an increase, I have a bonus. So after that, I kind of I kind of looked back on it and I really reflected on these people who are in my life and how they influenced me. So what I did was I started thinking to myself, how can I impact people as well? What can I do for other people? What can I do for you? What can I do for you? You know what I'm saying? So obviously I have a gift where I feel like I can excel. You know what I'm saying? I have the drive. I can go out there and make things happen. So what I wanted to do was create something that you know, could cater to all of you guys, and you guys could actually cater to other people, and the chain goes on. You know what I'm saying? So while I was working with all these people, I realized that something sparked in me, and I said, I'm going to start my own business. So that's when I came up the came up with the idea for Make a Change. And then I started saying, well, how can I learn how to do this? You know what I'm saying? I don't know anything about nonprofit, so I became a big brother. I have a little brother, his name is Ryan. And me and Ryan, you know, we, we connect very well. He's 13 years old. I actually took him out to eat a few, a few days ago. And while we're sitting there, he's telling me about all the stuff he loves doing. So. We're sitting there, and he's talking to me, and he's telling me how he loves doing maintenance. That's his thing, you know, because apparently he has a job in his apartment complex. He lives out in Forest Park where he loves doing maintenance. So anyway, I, I expressed to him, do you realize that you can actually be a maintenance, own a maintenance company? And he was like, yeah, that's true. I really could do that. I was like, yeah, so what it's really about is expanding your horizons and what do you guys think that you can do and how can you capitalize on that? How many of you guys love playing basketball? Just one person? Wow, when I was in high school, like everybody would have raised their hand. But anyway, so he loves playing basketball. Say it doesn't, I'm not you know, discrediting your ability or anything, but say it doesn't work out for him, what can you do? You can eventually end up being partial owner of a basketball team if you want to do that. And that's how everybody needs to start thinking. Um, I actually bought an article in, it's called HBR.com, the Harvard Business Review. And basically, it says, I'm going to read it here. It says, most people opt out of leadership for perfectly good reasons. The road by definition is unsafe. It leads to change, not comfort. Troy, the software service division manager, found it deeply unsettling to try, work, to try working in a brand new way. Eventually, though, he learned how to cope with his fears by relying on the advice and support of select friends and family members. We call these people the team. Troy's team played a key role in his shift from focusing on his own career to helping his colleagues succeed. After more than a few sleepless nights, Troy decided to host a casual dinner for the people whose opinions he valued most, a sister, two friends from college, and a software entrepreneur he would met at a recent Ironman competition. Halfway into the appetizer course, he put aside his pride, described his problem, and asked for advice. Your team members can be family, colleagues, friends, mentors, spouses, partners, and the litmus test is basically something you can do to ask yourself. And it says, does the leader in you regularly show up in their presence? Find the people who believe in your desire and ability to lead. Fall in love with them or at least meet them for drinks on a regular basis. Now, I don't expect you guys to meet them for drinks. You can go out and have a Sprite or something, but <laughs> don't go out drinking. But anyway, so basically what that's saying is, if you guys have people in your lives right now who are 
impacting you in some way, whether it be your mom or you have an older guy who you look up to, you want to latch onto them and absorb everything that they have to say, basically. Because you guys might be mentors right now and you don't even know it. Do any of you guys have little brothers or sisters? There you go, you're probably a mentor to them because they look up to you. So you have to lead by example. And the reason I like that article is because it's very true. And the people who are on my team are sitting right here. I have more people than that, but these are two key people in my team. Eve is actually a contractor with his dad. So he helps, you know, building things and fixing things like that. And I know by experience, he does very good work. And Sarah is actually a makeup artist. She has her own makeup business. So she, she, <laughs> she books appointments and basically people book her to come and do their makeup for weddings or photo shoots or whatever it may be. So these are two key people in my life because they help push me and I do the same for them. We hold each other accountable. So that's really important. Um, you know, it's just, it, it's always something that you have to ask yourself. Like, what are you guys doing right now, basically? You know? What are you doing right now in your life that's going to create a legacy for your future? You know, are you guys paying attention in school right now? Or are you kind of like laid back? Because when I look back on it now, and I, hmm? I, I do, I do. I really do wish I would have paid attention because I was just chilling <laughs> all through. Well, mainly my senior year, I was just sleeping all senior year. What school did you go to? Grayson. No, what college? Oh, I'm, at, I'm still at Georgia Gwinnett College. Okay. Yeah, and I'm studying finance. You know, basically, you just want to focus on what you guys are good at. Like, if you guys have anything that you're good at, you know, I know everybody in here has something that they're good at. And learn to love it and latch onto it and see how you can capitalize out of that. Like Sarah, for instance, she's really good at painting, okay? So that's how she kind of got her makeup thing going on because she's really good with the paintbrush, you know? But that's basically how that goes. But you guys really need to focus, okay, and think about where, what you want to do in the future, okay? Because right now, all this stuff that you think really matters, like, you know, this person talking about this person, this gossip over here, when you leave high school, none of that matters. The real world hits you in the face and then you're like, wow, like you start having bills to pay, you have all these responsibilities. So it's just really key that you guys focus on now because you guys have a legacy to create. Like if I were to ask you, what, what are you going to do for your future generations? What are you going to do? You don't know yet. But I mean, that's exactly where I was at. But I'm trying to encourage you guys to get the jump start now so in the future, you know what you want to do. You know what I'm saying? I actually don't even work at Nordstrom anymore. I work over at Neiman Marcus, which is over in. You have two jobs. Yeah, I'm a real estate agent and I work at Neiman Marcus. So over at Neiman Marcus, we sell really high end merchandise. So. <laughs> I'm talking about Prada, Gucci, um, all the Louis Vuitton. No, we don't sell Louis Vuitton. We do sell Louboutin, which is, you know, the shoes with the red soles that all the ladies love. We don't sell any FUBU. We don't sell any FUBU. We don't sell any FUBU. But we do... We, we do sell... We do... We do sell really high-end merchandise. And just to give you an example about someone, someone who really cares about what they do and made a difference, there's a lady who I work with. She works up in the Chanel boutique. Now, she came in there basically not knowing how to sell either. It was, you know, her first sales job or whatever. She actually is the top salesperson in the store, and she sells about $3 million a year, right? So when the commission rounds out, she ends up making about $230,000 a year. So it's all about what you love doing and how you can apply it to what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Everybody has a talent. It's just what are you willing to do to make it happen?
But I'm not, I'm not sitting here telling you guys that to go and start working at Neiman Marcus because they make a lot of money. Because it's not, I, I love doing what I do because I love selling. And my ultimate goal is to, you know, be a real estate investor where I can invest in different properties and, you know, things like that. Because I just love the art of a sale. I love the art of closing a deal. I mean, it can help me out. I feel like if I work at something like a shoe place or something, it can just help me. Uh, I like cars, and I'm going to get my car, uh, my dealer license. Mm -hmm. start selling cars or whatever. Well, that's a great idea, actually. I mean, there's nothing wrong with you're not always going to get to do exactly what you want to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, when I started selling shoes, that's not what I wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to play basketball because that's what I did every day after school and, and in high school. I was playing basketball, but hmm? I was actually really good. Our team was probably I had the Eve knows because we played on the same team, had like the worst record in the history of Georgia. Probably we were like 0 and 13. Yeah, so we were really bad. We actually played. Do you know um, Lewis Williams? No. He plays for the Sixers. He, um, he used to play for South Gwinnett, and we played him, and they actually blew us out horribly. But, you know, it, it's all about what you're willing to do. Are you willing to stay on the team and be a team player because, you know, it's the right thing to do, or do you want to just give up? And that's what you have to learn going throughout life. No, nah, because I lived in the Grayson School District. My mom worked. I can't. She couldn't take me to school. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, you're not you're not always you're not always right. You're not always going to be in the greatest situation. So you have to learn how to turn it around and make it into something. You know what I'm saying? I have a, I have a question. You mm -hmm. said you really like basketball. That's mm -hmm. what you wanted to do. And you didn't want to sell shoes, right. but you did. And you really you did really well at it. Right. Is there anything similar to you? about selling shoes in basketball. What was what responded to your in, internal needs about selling shoes that maybe basketball did as well? When I was a manager, okay, I'm managing over all of these people, and some of these people aren't necessarily the greatest, how can I say, the greatest talent you would want, you know, in your department. You know what I'm saying? They're showing up late. They, they're always talking back to you, whatever it may be. You know what I'm saying? It's the same thing with basketball. If you're, if you're on a basketball team, you don't want to be like the Plaxico Burris of your basketball team and shoot yourself in the leg and then you have all this controversy around you and stuff like that. You want to have the best people on your team. You know what I'm saying? You want to have people like Sarah, Eve, or some of you guys, or if you realize that you're one of those people who's bringing your team down, you want to start to become an example for the other people who you hang around. You want to set trends. You don't want to follow the trend. You know what I'm saying? So do you think it makes sense? Mm -hmm. let's, say, let's say you have a dream. Right. And, and, and in here, we talk about your passion and go for it and go for the dream. But let's say you have a dream and you think, OK, that'll never happen for me. Does it make sense to think about what do I enjoy about this and what other field would be good for me because it responds to the same type of need? Like you talked about a team. Right. If what you're looking for is being on a team, well, what profession could you be in that has a team? Right. And in selling at Nordstrom's, there's a team. Really, anything you do, there's a team. Right. So you think about what is important to me and how can I find it? Right. And see, that's what it was for me, really, with the real, when I transitioned over to real estate. So I'm there selling shoes. I love selling. I love closing a deal. So how can I apply this to something else I love? I love homes. That's my thing. Like, I love huge homes. I love the way homes are designed. So how about selling them? And if you're selling them at $300,000, $400,000 a pop, you're making a good living. You know what I'm saying? That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. How can how can you incorporate comedy into selling because you love selling? Well, basically, just like anything else you do, you're going to have to sell yourself. Okay, so when Steve Harvey started out, you know, I'm sure he he didn't have all the jokes and everybody didn't laugh at him. So what you're going to have to do is sell yourself. So what kind of image or what's going to be your stamp that makes you different? 
from everybody else because everybody, everybody's seen a Lil Wayne, everybody's seen a Jay-Z, everybody knows how they act. But you see they're their own individual person. So what are you going to do that makes you different from the next person who's telling jokes? You know what I'm saying? And then after you start, you know, telling your jokes and you get it all on camera and you're, you're big or whatever, you could start creating DVDs that people would buy, like Kevin Hart. Everybody seen that Kevin Hart oh, yes. DVD? Yes. Yeah. Look how big he just became off of telling jokes. It's all about how you market yourself. You know? Royston, it's also think about the feedback you get. Even if it doesn't feel good when you're getting it, forget the way it was given, but think about what's the message. And maybe they didn't get that, so I have to find another way to be funny with that. So sometimes forget the noise of the message, but listen to the message and say, okay, so I have to try another joke. That one wasn't funny for that audience. Right. I saw you on stage with Chris, and you're pretty quick. <laughs> and you, I don't Is know he? if you saw that. No, yeah. I didn't yeah. see him. It's funny. Oh, okay. Yeah, he got a little kick from Chris. <laughs> they don't say that to me yet yeah, in a good way because he liked his joke. Right. But see, that, that's the thing. Like, you guys... I don't want you guys to expect to get to the top just like even when you graduate from college like a lot of times you're not going to just jump to the top and make all the money in the world there's a certain hustle or grind that you have to do all the way up to that point it's called paying your dues so he might be the biggest comedian in like 10 years but the first time he goes out there no one laughs at his jokes but eventually someone's going to laugh and he's going to take off. No one just jumps right up to the top, you know what I'm saying? That's just how it is in, in the world, I mean. Has anyone ever read the do. book um, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell? I don't know if you ever read that book. Mm -mm. But he basically says kind of what you said, it takes 10 years to become an expert. Right. So in the beginning you're not going to do that well. And then all of a sudden you're an expert at it, but it's because you failed a lot. Right. And, and I, that's part of it. Right, and I'm really hard on myself because that's how I used to be. Like, I used to want things to just take off, off, yeah, just happen for me. So even when I just, start, when I first started at Neiman's, my first day on the floor, I probably sold like $500 worth of stuff. Then you have all these guys working around me and they're selling like four or 5,000. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, oh my God, like, can it happen just today? You know what I'm saying? I'm getting down on myself. I'm thinking I'm not gonna make enough money. But eventually, you just start racking up. And, the day and, that you sold 500, mm -hmm. and they sold 5,000, mm -hmm. do you know if they were looking at you, looking at you thinking, oh, he's going to be great, even though you were sitting there thinking, I'm failing, Right. do you know if they were looking at you as more experienced people in more of a mentor role thinking, he's going to be great? Right. I mean, they, they possibly were. There's a, there's a huge possibility they were, because when I walk into a job, I try to command respect, you know what I'm saying? So. Me selling $500 probably didn't impact them at all. They probably thought to themselves, wow, this kid's sharp, and he's only 21 working with us. And, you know, he's holding his own so far, so he's probably going to be great. Did they, I don't know what kind of environment it is. Is it a competitive environment? Very, or they help? very, it's very competitive. competitive. So no one's helping you. No one's going to help you well, out. Well, they'll help you. Like, if, if you needed help <laughs> ringing something up, or, but as far as the sale, if you're getting interacting with the yeah customer. interacting with the customer they're really not gonna body's gonna try and cut you off and you know try and get over on you and you'll realize that as you go through life but you really have to focus on what you're trying to do and what your goal is because you're not always going to be on top but you can get there if you stay focused and you're determined so let's go back to high school mm -hmm. and did you have any drive in high school because you said you have a lot of drive now. <laughs> I really didn't have much drive for some reason. And I think, a, I think a lot of it was because I think my parents' separation had a lot more to do with it than I really liked to believe at the okay. time, because I would act like it didn't bother me. But me not having both parents in my household, I'd come home, the first thing I'd do you know, start playing basketball, probably get on the phone with the girl or something, you know. Things like that. And then maybe even get into an argument before the night's over with my mom like every day about something. <laughs> but that's how it was, you know? And 
it really didn't hit me until I started working for myself and being around other people who influenced me that that's not the right way to act. And I didn't realize how mature I got until they offered me that position in um, Lady Shoes as an assistant manager. What would be the message that you wish someone had given you then? Or was there a message they could have given you that maybe would have made just, you I mean, more interested? Just more to interested? really apply myself. Because honestly, if I had applied myself more, I probably could have you know, done AP classes. Because I passed all my classes. And the way that I passed was I was really good at writing essays and doing projects. And that, those things were a big enough percentage for me to pass my class. So I always did that, and I might fail like a few of my tests, but I still ended up coming out on top in the end. So, I mean, I basically was like a B and C student. You know, I was, I got a few A's here and there, but, you know, it really didn't start hitting me until I started working on my own and realizing that there's other responsibilities and I should really start focusing now because my future is really important to me. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things that probably aren't going to be in place for you guys in the future that are in place now. Right. So you guys really have to, you know, keep your eye on the ball right now. Now this is, a, this is a class of peer leaders. Mm -hmm. So I think that you guys really have an opportunity. As peer leaders, you have a huge opportunity to take a role in shaping yourselves and other people by setting setting an example right what would you what would you tell them what would you encourage them to do as peer leaders at Grady High School as peer leaders just basically stay focused and set the trend if you're a peer leader that means you're not a follower so <laughs> you guys should be leading the way you know what I'm saying breaking the mold you guys all have something that you're good at. I, I know you have some kids in your school who probably don't care about anything and just, you know, are being knuckleheads, but you guys have to be the leaders. Don't, don't talk about him. He's cool. <laughs> but yeah, I actually, I wanted to share with you that I went up to New York about a month ago for my cousin's funeral. My cousin passed away. He was like, I think it was around 40 years old, my cousin. And he passed away, but before he passed away, he wrote a book, right? And the book is actually on sale at Amazon.com right now. But that was something that gave him a sense of fulfillment. So he made sure that he got that in before he passed because he had a heart condition, so he kind of knew that you know, his end was coming. But he wrote that book before he passed. So you guys are all alive, young, and you have all your health right now. So what are you guys going to start doing? You know what I'm saying? To create your legacy. Because that book is going to be stamped for years to come. Like everybody, and it could sell a million copies. He could be like the next J.K. Rowling, or he could sell 10 copies. But the fact that that book is out there, that's something that has his name on it. So what do you guys like to do? And what are you going to put your name on? You know? <laughs> I, I'll go out to the movies. I just actually went to the Knicks game the other night to watch the Knicks versus uh, the Hawks. It was a really good game. I enjoy going to basketball games, things like that. But I do work a lot, and my friends will tell you that. I work a ton, and you just have to know how to balance your time. And it's the same thing in school right now. You guys have to learn how to balance your time. I'm not asking you guys to go home and study all night long and never have any fun, you know what I'm saying? But make sure that you find time to study so you can pass your classes and then you can go and have fun. One of the main things right now with my, I have a little sister, she's 18 years old, she's about to graduate. And she's trying to go on spring break for, um, to Panama City Beach, Florida. And my mom is just totally like, no, you're not going, you're not going. You know what I'm saying? Because she's failing her math class. So my mom's like, no, you're not going because you're failing. She's like, yeah, I'm going. It's my senior year, so we'll see what happens. But I, <laughs> I try and tell her, like, you, you should really try and focus on passing this class because if you don't pass, you're not going to graduate. 
you're going to go to spring break, come back, and then you're going to still be in high school for another year, so you better pass. You know, it's all about what, you guys have to find out what's really important and what really matters and apply that to your everyday life. And that's how it's going to be throughout your whole life. You always have to weigh your options all the time. You know what I'm saying? A lot of you guys are going to think like some of the guys in here. And, and when I was in high school, me dating this girl was more important to me than me, you know, doing what was the right thing to do. And my mom would always tell me. I remember one time she actually showed up at this girl's house that I was at. I was at this girl's house and she showed up and came and said, you need to go home and started talking to her mom and told me that I need to go home and study. It's a school night. And I told her, I'm not, I'm not riding home with you, I'm walking. You know, I, I was trying to be cool or whatever. And I walk home, she started yelling at me. I yelled at her, next thing you know, I'm kicked out the house. And then now that I'm looking back on it now though, that girl wasn't even worth doing all that for. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't worth it. And that's how you guys have to look at these things, you know? How would you describe your relationship with your mom now? Oh, we have like the best relationship. And I think part of it is probably because like I'm out of the house now. So we, <laughs> we don't have to bicker back and forth, but you know, we used to get into it about everything. Like the, the main reason I got my job at Wendy's was so I could go and buy my Jordans. You know, I, I wasn't worried about saving or nothing. I wanted to buy my Jordans. That's what I cared about. But now that I look back on it, I don't need a ton of Jordans. I don't even wear Jordans now. You know what I'm saying? There was no reason for me to go out there and spend all my money on that stuff. I do have a lot of shoes now. I will admit that. Do you buy them at Nordstrom's? No. Well, yeah, <laughs> some of them I have bought there, but I buy them all over the place. But, you know, you guys just have to really you have to sit back and think about what you're doing sometimes and that's what it takes you know because a lot of times you just act out in the moment and this seems like the right thing to do in the moment all my friends are doing it let me start cracking on this kid right here it's it's funny you know what i'm saying but realistically it's not because you know what i'm saying that could potentially hurt you don't know how that person's taking it on and they could turn around and do something right you never know and that, that, I mean, I was actually... And that's an important, that's a really important point. Right. And I was actually one of the kids in high school who would join in and start making fun of someone else, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it didn't make it right. And now that I look back on it, I, I shouldn't have done that. And if I see some of the kids who I did that to, I would walk right up to them and say, look, man, I'm sorry, or whatever, I, I really apologize. Let's keep it moving. I was really immature at the time, but... You guys will realize as you go, grow up that you'll mature out of that stuff quickly. Because all of the stuff, I'm tell I promise you, like all of this stuff that you guys are dealing with now does not matter. As far as like, you know, peer pressure and all that other stuff, you guys, it's not gonna matter in a few years. Your studies do matter, but you know, what this person's wearing, how this person doesn't have the hottest shoes on, this per you know, that, no one cares about that in the future. When, when you're at Nordstrom's, did, do you think you, like my understanding of Nordstrom's is it's great customer service. Right. And is that something that you, having worked there, believe? Oh, yeah. So one of the main things at Nordstrom is when the customer comes in, you greet them within 30 seconds. You let them know, you give them options of whatever they want. So if they bring out a blue shoe, you bring out an orange shoe and a high heel and blah, 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 you know, all of that. And I believe in that because I think you can implicate that in your everyday life. Because right. if someone comes up to you today and you start conversating with them, you're gonna know how to talk to them the right way. You know what I'm saying? If I meet you for the first time, you're not, I w I'm pretty sure you wouldn't come up to me like this, but I'm saying you're not gonna come, what up dog, blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm saying? You would never do that if you're giving customer service to somebody. You know what I'm saying? So it gave, you, it gave you a more professional outlook on life. Now, and, and that's how you have to be, realistically. What of those lessons have you brought with you to make a change? Well, 
what I try to do is... And, and everyone, you told them what Make a Change was. Um, did everybody hear about Make a Change? And if you would tell them again, just because... It's, it's, it's a mentoring organization that caters to kids from age 12 to 17. That's your organization that you started. Right. right. I started this. And basically, it's like life coaching. So, I mean, any of you guys can contact me if you want to send me an email, whatever. And basically what we'll do is I'll take them out, I'll take kids out, I talk to them, they ask me for advice, I give them advice. And my main, what my goal is, is to become huge so that I can reach out to the masses. I don't just want to mentor one kid, two kids, three kids. I want to have like a staff. Eva is actually on the board for Make a Change. And I want to have a staff that caters to a ton of kids and talks to a ton of kids, you know? Why'd you choose those ages to mentor? Well, 12 is kind of like that age, like right before becoming a teen. So it's kind of like you're starting to mold them right before, well, I don't want to mold anybody, but you know what I'm saying? Just kind of Catch them right, before. right before they hit that age. And then 17, because it's right before Adult. kids graduate and go off and become, you know? How do they find you? How do these kids find you? Well, they, can con they contact me uh, through email, but I'm actually in the process of building the website and everything right now. But you'll be surprised at how many kids really need mentoring. Because you're, I mean, just me walking through, you know, the supermarket or the mall or whatever, and say, you know, I hand out a business card or something, or, or like I'll know people from my mom's job who have kids, and they'll recommend the kids to come hang out with me. It's, it's really easy because there's so many kids who need to be mentored.